Hello, thank you for coming by. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 339. Today, we're talking about the legendary Joe Lewis. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I'm the founder of Whistlekick, and we make great stuff. We make sparring gear. We make, most recently, some belts. We've got Olympic or WT style sparring gear. We just keep rolling out new stuff. You can check out all of it at whistlekick.com. And much of it is available on Amazon. If you want to find notes for this show or any of our other episodes, including transcripts, photos, videos, a whole bunch of great stuff, you can find that at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Our social media is pretty easy. It's at whistlekick. And you can email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Let's talk about Joe Lewis. I've got quite a few pages prepared here. And at the end, I'm kind of going to go off script and talk about Joe Lewis more from a personal place, because he occupies this very interesting space in my life and my training. And I'll tell you more in a few minutes after I'm done reading what we've got here. If there was one person we could regard as the greatest karate fighter, it's probably Joe Lewis. In fact, he was voted twice as the greatest karate fighter of all time. Lewis was an American kickboxer and karate point fighter who won many, many tournaments from 1970 to 1983, during which he earned the titles U.S. Heavyweight Kickboxing Champion, World Heavyweight Full Contact Karate Champion, and United States National Black Belt Kata Champion. Even the legendary Bruce Lee regarded him as the greatest karate fighter of all time. He's known by many as the father of modern kickboxing or father of American kickboxing. Now, aside from his kickboxing career, he was also an actor and he appeared in nine films. His last film was Death Fighter, which wasn't released until 2017, five years after his death. Joseph Henry Lewis was born on March 7, 1944 in Nightdale, North Carolina, where he grew up on a farm. He enlisted in the Marines and his first duty was to be stationed at Marine Corps Air Station, Cherry Point in Havelock, North Carolina, from July 20th, 62 to April 12th, 1964. A month after that, he was stationed in Okinawa, where he got the chance to study martial arts, particularly Shorinru, with Aizo Shimabu Koro, who was his first instructor. He also trained with John Koreb, Chinsaku Kinjo, who was the one who promoted him to black belt, and Seiyu Oyata, the creator of Ryote. In just seven months, he earned his black belt. Lewis was also one of the thousands of U.S. military sent by President Kennedy into Vietnam. This is where he first met the boxer, Rocky Graziano. Afterwards, he was transferred to Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune in Jacksonville, North Carolina. After he was released from active duty, he returned to the United States. Lewis received several medals as a Vietnam War veteran. These include the Marine Corps Good Conduct Medal, National Defense Service Medal, and Armed Forces Expeditionary Medal. His fellow Marines recognized his skill in karate, so they urged him to join competitions, though his Japanese masters did not tell him to do so. The first tournament he entered was Jun Ri's third National Karate Championships on May 7, 1966, held in Washington, D.C. Lewis easily won match after match, using his now-famous sidekick to finish off his opponents. The referee even asked him why he only used a sidekick, and Lewis' answer was simple. Because they can't block it. This was Lewis's first tournament win. From 1967 until 1968, Lewis trained privately under Bruce Lee, where he learned the devastating double hook combination that he used to win his later tournaments. Lewis was Lee's first choice to play the role of Colt in the film The Way of the Dragon. However, Lewis refused the role, so Chuck Norris was selected instead. In 1975, Lewis was married to Barbara Lee, a former American actress and fashion model. Unfortunately, their marriage lasted just two years. Lewis continued to compete until 1983 and participated in three exhibitions through 1991. He was also active in giving seminars after his retirement. In July 2011, he was diagnosed with a malignant brain tumor, which was operated on in the same month. The operation was successful. However, he died a year later, on August 31st, 2012, at Coatesville Veterans Affairs Medical Center in Coatesville, Pennsylvania. Lewis' karate career started when he won Junri's third national championship in 1966. He had only trained for 22 months at that point, 
but he defeated all of his opponents, who were known to be the best of the best in the United States, including Thomas LaPuppet Carroll, who became a member of both the USA Karate Hall of Fame and the Black Belt Hall of Fame. Carroll was the eighth opponent, and Lewis defeated him by a 2-0 to zero decision. Lewis wasn't even familiar with the rules of light contact karate, which was the only form of the sport in the U.S. at that time. From 1966 to 1969, Lewis remained as the U.S. Nationals Grand Champion. He also defeated Mitchell Bobrow and Frank Hargrove at the 1967 Nationals in Washington. Before that, he had already defeated Hargrove at the Henry Cho's Karate Tournament in New York City, where he also defeated Chuck Norris. Lewis was bested by Alan Steen in 1966 at the Long Beach Internationals. The next year, Lewis defeated Waylon Norris, Chuck Norris's younger brother, Steve Labounty, Frank Knoll, and Frank Hargrove. The year 1968 was a turning point for Lewis' career. He joined the first, quote, professional karate tournament, namely the first World Professional Karate Championships, WPKC, promoted by Jim Harrison, which was held in Harrison's Dojo in Kansas City. Other popular fighters joined as well, including Bob Wall, Skipper Mullins, Pat Burleson, David Moon, and Fred Wren. Lewis won the tournament and was paid $1, making him the first professional champion in karate history. Lewis' next fight was at the 1968 Orient vs. U.S. tournament that was promoted by Aaron Banks, where he lost to a Japanese-American named Tanaka. In the same year, he joined the first professional karate tournament held in Dallas, Texas, where he won the championship against Larry Whitner, Phil Ola, and Skipper Mullins. Lewis lost again as he faced Victor Moore at the World Hemisphere Karate Championships in August 1968, held in San Antonio, Texas. The event was promoted by Robert Trias, creator of the Shuriru style, and Atlee Chittum. The prize money was $1,000, and it was split between Moore and Lewis. In the same year, at a different tournament, Lewis got another victory against Lewis Delgado, who had defeated Chuck Norris the year prior. Lewis had a comeback. Just three months later, after his defeat from Victor Moore, at the World Professional Karate Championships, held by Aaron Banks on November 24, 68. Lewis defeated Victor Moore and got the World Heavyweight title. He also won $600 in prize money. Two years after, at the All-Star Team Championships in Long Beach, California, Lewis lost again to a fighter named John Natividad. However, he won against Mitchell Barbro for the Heavyweight Championship and against Joe Hayes for the Grand Championship at the Battle of Atlanta, promoted by Joe Corley. In 1972, Lewis lost against Darnell Garcia at the International Karate Championships tournament made famous, held by Ed Parker. In the same year, Lewis won against Jerry Piddington at the Grand Nationals held in Memphis, Tennessee. In 1974, Lewis participated in three major tournaments. First, he participated in the Hiri Ochiai National Karate Tournament in May, where he lost to Charles Curry. Just several days later, he was in the PAWAK tournament. He got through the elimination matches against Frank Harvey, Smiley Urquidez, Benny the Jad Urquidez, and Cecil Peoples. Finally, he won against Steve Sanders with a 4-3 decision. The last one of the three tournaments was at the Top 10 National Professional Karate Tournament. Just an aside, some of these names are terrible. These tournament names? All right, back into the script. By Mike Anderson. He lost against Everett Monster Man Eddie in the finals. And this was the final year of Lewis Karate Tournament competition. Lewis wanted to enhance his skills more, even though he was already an excellent fighter. Aside from his training in Okinawa and his time with Bruce Lee, he trained with boxing coach Joey Orbello. In one way or the other, these mentors contributed to his belief that martial arts could be more entertaining by being a full contact sport. He felt that the sport was not real, was not valuable, unless it was full contact. In 1969, Lewis got the chance to participate in a full contact karate tournament promoted by Lee Faulkner, namely the United States Karate Championships. Lewis made it clear to Faulkner that he would not participate unless it was full contact, and Faulkner agreed. Lewis fought against Greg Baines. When they entered the ring, the announcer identified them as kickboxers and the fight as American kickboxing. This term was also used by Black Belt Magazine in May 1970. Lewis won the match by knocking Baines out in the second round, and this is where many say kickboxing was born. His next kickboxing match was against Big Ed Daniel on June 20th, 1970 at the USA Professional Open Karate Championships promoted by Lee Faulkner 
and Alan Steen. Lewis defeated Daniel in the second round, despite the latter's advantage in size, and was reportedly taken to a hospital afterwards because of a brain hemorrhage. They had a rematch, and Lewis was victorious again by knocking Daniel out, this time in three rounds. Lewis' next match was at the second annual United Nations Open Karate Championships, promoted by Aaron Banks on January 24, 1971. He defeated the state champion and 10th Don, Ronnie Barku, at a minute 25 into the first round. Lewis participated again at the United States Championship kickboxing bouts, still promoted by Banks. He won against Atlas Jesse King in three rounds by knockout. If you're noticing a trend here, you are. Lewis defended his United States heavyweight kickboxing title in eight consecutive matches, which all resulted in knockouts between 1970 and 1971. His excellent record made him the first kickboxer to be featured in top sports magazines, such as The Ring and Sports Illustrated. In 1971, Lee Faulkner tried to organize a match between Lewis and a Thai kickboxing champion for a world title match. However, the fight did not materialize for two reasons. The first, there were no heavyweights in Asia. The heaviest Asian fighter was only 162 pounds. The fight organizers asked Lewis to lose 10 pounds, while the Asian fighter to gain 10 pounds. Lewis agreed to this, but he couldn't agree on the payment, which was the second reason. The organizers wanted to pay the Asian champion $3,000 for the fight, but they only wanted to pay Lewis $1,000. While it was important to Lewis to have that world title, he stuck to his principles and declined the offer. Lewis retired by the end of 1971, undefeated in his kickboxing career with a record of 10-0, all knockouts. He was the undisputed United States heavyweight kickboxing champion. In 1974, Lewis participated in an all-new full-contact karate in Los Angeles, California, introduced by Mike Anderson. This was where the competitors wore foam hand and footgear, and the fight could end in a knockout. Lewis, being an undisputed champion of heavyweight kickboxing, easily won the PKA, Professional Karate Association, heavyweight full-contact karate title. He knocked out Frank Brodar of Yugoslavia in the second round. In the same evening, Jeff Smith and Bill Superfoot Wallace also won in their respective divisions for light heavyweight and for middleweight. He was featured in Black Belt Magazine Hall of Fame as the 1974 Full Contact Karate Fighter of the Year. Many of you, I'm going off script again, many of you have seen the photo from that night with Joe Lewis, Jeff Smith, and Bill Wallace wearing their Stars and Stripes uniforms. The three of them together, that's that night. That's when that happened. On July 27th, 1975, Lewis participated in the World Series of Martial Arts Championships in Honolulu, Hawaii. He had just married Barbara Lee two days before. During the match, Lewis was overconfident at first, and he was even knocked down to the canvas by Ron Clay. However, Lewis took the fight seriously, got back up, and he knocked out Clay with a blow to the head. Supposedly, Clay was a purple belt in Kaji Kenbo. In the same competition, Lewis fought against a formidable opponent named Teddy Limos. Lewis took a blow, and it hurt his eye. The doctor said he could continue, so he did, but Lewis ultimately lost to Limos by decision. The next month, on August 24th, 1975, Lewis fought Ross Scott. During the match, allegedly in the third round, Lewis dislocated his shoulder. He was given five minutes to rest, and then the match continued. Lewis received quite a few kicks to the head, but blocked most of them. However, Lewis ultimately lost by decision. He won two rounds while Scott had won three, and the others were a draw. This loss stripped Lewis of his PKA World Heavyweight Championship title. And Lewis rested for a while after this loss. He starred in a couple movies, Jaguar Lives in 78 and Force 5 in 81. Then, in 1983, Lewis had his second comeback. His first match was against Bill Morrison, who had a 10-1 record. Lewis defeated Morrison by knockout, though Morrison reported that he was blackmailed into fighting Lewis by the promoter when he announced he was planning to cancel the fight. On February 3rd, 1983, Lewis won on points against Curtis Cowboy Crandall, who had a 19-2 record. Lewis then fought against Tom Hall, who had a 13-2-1 record, but lost by unanimous decision. Later on, he lost to Mark Georgantis Georgantis, by decision. I don't know how to say that name. I apologize. Lewis lost in his match against Kerry Roop, 
for the PKA US heavyweight title, and Lewis suffered an injury above the eye that ultimately stopped the match in the fourth round. After this series of defeats, Lewis retired. His overall record, combining his careers both in kickboxing and PKA full contact karate, was 17 wins, 4 losses, with 15 of the wins coming from knockout. Then, in 1990, after several years of retirement, Lewis fought against his best friend, Bill Wallace, in a kickboxing exhibition match. The match was labeled Speed versus Power by a number of promoters and people watching. Wallace won the exhibition match with two judges scoring a tie, while the third favored Wallace. Lewis recalled that he was warned not to go all out as he had a 30-pound advantage over Bill Wallace, and they remained friends afterwards. Lewis was not known only for his extraordinary power, but also his speed. In his youth, Lewis was a weightlifter and he wrestled in college. After he won his first few tournaments, his presence was intimidating to other fighters, as they all knew he had both strength and skill. According to Lewis, his training with Bruce Lee taught him, quote, good strong positioning, being able to bridge the gap fast, being explosive off the initial move, and mobility. Overall, Lewis studied the following styles, Shorinru Karate, Kickboxing, Jeet Kune Do, Ryukyu Kempo, Tai Chi Chuan, Judo, and Wrestling. Having the knowledge of all of these styles made Lewis a well-rounded and formidable fighter. Joe Lewis was diagnosed with a malignant brain tumor in July of 2011. After 13 months of hard-fought battle, he passed away on August 31st, 2012 at Coatesville Veterans Affairs Medical Center in Coatesville, Pennsylvania. The cancer had already spread to his left shoulder and hip. He was 68 years old. The father of American kickboxing was buried in the Nightdale Baptist Church Cemetery at Nightdale, Wake County, North Carolina. Lewis' legacy includes the full-contact karate system that he left behind. He was the one who introduced full-contact karate in the USA and was considered the father of modern kickboxing. Some say the character Ken Masters of the popular video game series Street Fighter seems to have been based on Joe Lewis. The character also visited Japan to study karate and came back to the USA to become a U.S. champion. I can't say for sure, but I personally choose to believe. Lewis appeared in nine films. The Wrecking Crew, Jaguar Lives, Force 5, San Long, Mr. X, Blood Moon, The Cutoff, Kill Em All, and the posthumous Death Fighter. It is quite the legacy that he has left. And this is where I want to talk a bit more personally. Everything I just read, this was researched, it's, it's fact stuff. But I don't know that it fully expresses this man's legacy. I never met Joe Lewis. I was not lucky enough to. However, quite a few people who have been on this show, quite a few people who have become my friends, did spend a lot of time with this man. And I feel that I've gotten to know who he was through them. What I find most fascinating is that Joe Lewis, the man, is the person most likely to bring some of these amazing martial artists to tears as they talk about him. I'm not going to name names, but I can think of four people who have been on this show, who have come to tears in front of me talking about Joe Lewis. Now, we've heard some folks get emotional on this show. But what I find fascinating, what I find most expressive of who Joe Lewis was is the fact that in one sentence, people can talk about how rough he was, how aggressive, how honestly brutal he could be, and yet how much love the way he treated people created. I never tire of hearing of the stories about Joe Lewis, whether they're told from Bill Wallace or any of the other folks who have been on the show. And if you ever attend a Superfoot seminar with Bill Wallace, or if you have in the past, you know that it's pretty likely he's going to mention Joe Lewis, or as Bill Wallace will refer, just Joe. He'll talk about Joe. And everyone knows who he's talking about. This was his best friend. And as much as we think about 
Bill Wallace as being the greatest kicker ever. The one person that I've heard him talk about and his kicks as being incredible is Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis's sidekick. So if you hear me being a little bit emotional talking about him, especially as I was reading about him passing away, it's because of the empathy I have for these folks that I've gotten to know who knew him. When I consider what I've done in martial arts, when I consider what's happening in Whistlekick, I believe that for the rest of my life, my greatest regret, not that I really had a lot of choice in the matter, because I didn't know, but in hindsight, I wish I could have trained with Joe Lewis, even once at a seminar, even just to meet him, so I could put some better context to these things that I've read, to these stories I've heard. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I hope you understood how important this man is to martial arts as we understand it today. This is a story, his life, this story of his life threads through so many others. I suspect you recognize quite a few of those names. June Rhee, Ed Parker, Bruce Lee, Bill Wallace, Fred Wren, and a bunch of others. His life weaves through so much of what is important to us as martial artists. We can't let his memory fade. If you want to check out the transcript, because of the multitude of dates and names that I mentioned today, you can find that at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com, and you can find us on social media. We are at Whistlekick. I'd love for you to share this episode, or maybe leave a review on iTunes or somewhere else. Just Help us out. Help people find the show. Help the show grow. Help us make an impact as we reach as many traditional martial artists as we can. Thank you for your time today. Thanks for listening. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.